thank you everyone for being here and thank you truly for your interest in this particular topic, which is something that reflects the history of a major event that took place 80 years ago this past weekend. That being the longest walk, which is all part and parcel of Operation Overlord. And Operation Overlord, better known as D-Day, 6th of June, the invasion of France. So what I'd like to do is move through this presentation and tell you not just what, not just how, but more importantly, why did this invasion succeed? So with this being the case, let's get started with, yes, the presentation on the longest walk. We do zero in on the 29th Infantry Division because it's a key infantry division during the course of the operation that does play a significant part in bringing about the success of D-Day 6th of June. So with the 29th Infantry Division on 6th of June, 1944, let's take a look at this. On this date, 80 years ago, just a couple of days ago, the U.S. 29th Infantry Division participates in the greatest amphibious assault ever planned, ever planned, involved, in essence, the landing of six Allied assault divisions over a 50-mile Normandy coast beachfront in northwest France. How far is 50 miles in terms of length? Well, if you're on the Jersey Shore and you're looking west, 50 miles west takes you out to Trenton, New Jersey. That's the length. That's the length of this coastal beach area that this invasion took place within. And here's a famous picture of American troops approaching what's known as Omaha Beach during the course of Operation Overlord. The assault, Operation Overlord, is the foundation of the overall Allied strategic plan to defeat Nazi Germany. So let's take a look at this a little more closely. With the 29th Infantry Division, which is part and parcel of this entire invasion, it's known as the Blue and the Gray Division. And it's the exploits, as I mentioned before, of this division across a particular beach known as Omaha Beach on the Normandy coast and the capture by this division of St. Lo, France, which I'll talk about later on. Forty agonizing days later on. That's the reason why this presentation is entitled The Longest Walk. And in essence, they succeed in doing so, and they determine the success of D-Day 6th of June. Where is the 29th Infantry Division from? Let's take a look at it. It's the National Guard Division consisting of units from Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and Southern New Jersey, right from our area. And these, in essence, are men that participate in this invasion. And because of where they came from, this is the basis for the design of the uniform patch, the blue and the gray. So many of the relatives of those in Virginia and Maryland. They served in the Confederate Army during the Civil War. And so many relatives of those that are serving from Delaware and Southern New Jersey, they served in the Union Army. Therefore, it's a reason why the patch was established as such. Part blue, part gray in color. And therefore, the division was known as the blue and the gray. All right, moving on. As far as the Allied strategic plan for the European Theater of War during World War II, let's take a look at this. Overall idea is to invade the continent of Europe and engage Nazi Germany in a two-front war until its ultimate defeat. One front coming from the West, and in essence, that's the Allies providing troops to cross the beaches of France and moving inland. 
on the eastern side, there's another force that was opposing the Germans, and that was the Russians moving in from the east to the west, confronting the Germans across Central Europe. So the, the whole idea was to invade the continent of Europe and engage Nazi Germany in a two-front war until its ultimate defeat. And the goal was determined at the Arcadia Conference held in Washington, D.C., a conference held right after the Pearl Harbor raid on 7 December 1941. Who called this meeting? It was our president. President Franklin Roosevelt, he wanted to talk to the principal, the principal allied leader in Europe, and that is the prime minister of Great Britain, Winston Churchill. Basically, he wanted to sit down with Winston Churchill and say, okay, how are we going to win this war? And these gentlemen, together with their combined chiefs of staff that were with them, they determined the strategy that ultimately does defeat Nazi Germany. And in essence, here are elements of the strategic plan. Invade Northwest France. And the arrow will point out where that's located. And then thereafter, surround and seize the German rural industrial basin crippling Nazi Germany's ability to supply its war effort. And then the Red Star will note where the Ruhr Basin is located. Upon doing so, capture Berlin and eliminate the Nazi government. Therefore, defeat Nazi Germany via a total unconditional surrender. Roosevelt in particular, who remembers World War I because he was served as a assistant Navy secretary during that war. He remembers that what brought an end to that war was an armistice. And in essence, what occurs 20 years later on, despite that armistice, another major war in Europe. The one thing that in essence, President Roosevelt did not want to do was bring an end to this war via another armistice. The goal was to go in and defeat Nazi Germany and accept only one thing and one thing only, unconditional surrender. So let's see what comes about now. Key operation of this all is Operation Overlord. It's the Allied amphibious invasion across five assault beaches, which I'll point out to you in a few moments, in northern, northwest France. And in addition to those five, uh, those invading forces, in essence, you're also going to have three airborne landings on the flanks of these assaulting divisions. And take a look at how many people are involved, the number of ships involved, and the number of planes involved. Again, the biggest amphibious invasion, in essence, amphibious operation ever conducted. Now, as far as the beaches that I'm referring to, here they are. One beach, as the Blue Arrow points out, is what's known as Utah Beach. Assaulting Utah Beach was one division of the United States Army. And that was the 4th Infantry Division. And then Omaha Beach, which had been referenced. Omaha Beach was assaulted by two divisions of the U.S. Army. The 1st U.S. Infantry Division and the 2nd Infantry Division. And that third arrow that came up was the area of the Gold Beach. The Objective of the Gold Beach was to be seized by a Canadian an infantry division within the British Army, and that's the 50th Infantry Division. Juno Beach was to be seized by a division within the Canadian Army, and that was the third 
Infantry Division of the Canadian Army. And the fifth beach, known as Sword Beach, it was to be seized by another division within the British Army, that being the third infantry division. So here are your five division, your five major beaches that are to be insult, insulted by all these invading forces. And the flanks of those invading forces were to be protected by airborne division. One airborne division landing as you're looking at the screen on the right. And that's the sixth airborne division. And on the left of the invading forces were two airborne forces, airborne divisions from the U.S. military, that being the 82nd Airborne Division and the 101st Airborne Division. This is the nature of this major, major operation, largest amphibious invasion force ever put together and utilized during the course of any invasion. So Operation Overlord does take place on D-Day, 6th of June, 1944. It had to succeed. Why? Because the failure or containment of the operation would have resulted in a prolonged war in Europe at great cost. Let me come back on this. As far as our allied Supreme Commander, U.S. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, he had no backup plan for this invasion. No backup plan. And our biggest fear, that being exhibited by our President and Winston Churchill, is the Soviet Premier, Joseph Stalin, head of the Soviet Union. He would have sought an armistice with Nazi Germany to end a bitter war in Russia if the operation failed. At this particular time, the Russians, although they're moving forward from east to west, from within Russia to assault the area of Central Europe, they were suffering bitterly. And if indeed this invasion, which they're well aware was going to take place, had failed, it could very well be that Joseph Stalin would have sought an armistice and brought an end to the war on the Eastern Front. So with all this being the case, let's now take a look at why the Normandy area was chosen to conduct the amphibious operation known as Operation Overlord. Well, one, major French ports are nearby, Cherbourg and Lahar, and these ports needed to be taken by the invading forces so that the forces that came forth across the beaches afterwards could be well supplied to move inland into France and ultimately into Germany. Landing areas within range of fighter cover from southern Britain. Many of the RAF, Royal Air Force, and the U.S. Army Air Force Many of the air bases were located south of south of London, in essence, in southern Britain. And in essence, the planes were basically less than 75 miles away from, from the invading area. So the landings were within range of fighter cover from southern England. And the beaches were very, very supportive with gravel roads leading from the beach exit from the beaches up to up to the cliffs overlooking in particular Omaha Beach. One thing about the beaches along all of the invasion areas, they were unlike the sand that covers the entire coastline of New Jersey. When you walk the actual battlefield in Normandy, France, when you walk the beaches where all this took place, you think you're walking on an asphalt road. That's how strong the beachfront happens to be. It would very, be very, very supportive 
of tanks and trucks and armored vehicles coming across and moving up into off of the beach. The beach is therefore very supportive for gravel road exits leading from the beach fronts. More on that in a moment. And there was appropriate tidal factors. Low tide at 6.30 in the morning. Now, the person that makes this decision in particular is General Eisenhower. He had remembered how his forces came across during an invasion of North Africa in November of 1942. So it was Operation Torch. And when they came across, the, the invading forces came across during that operation, they landed at high tide, not low tide. And one of the major problems that were faced thereafter was the fact that when the tide went out, all the landing craft got stuck on the beaches. Got stuck on the beaches. So with this in mind, Eisenhower demanded that the invasion take place at 6.30 in the morning on, on, any, on any day in which the invasion was to take place. And because it would be at low tide along the English Channel. So therefore, what comes about is the invasion does take place at 6.30 in the morning. And because of it, the landing craft that came in with the troops and the supplies, they landed everything. And yes, as Eisenhower would have hoped, it does take place. Tide comes in thereafter, lifts the landing craft up, and enables the craft operators to move all the way back to where the supply ships and the troop transports were located, 10 miles off the coast, 10 miles off the coast, reload them with troops, have them reloaded with supplies, and move back in to further, further enable them to support the invading force. Kinderland's very supportive of mobile operations. In the home ports, were nearby the ports that the Allies were utilizing for this operation were nearby enabling quick resupply, and those ports were located in southern England, in particular Portsmouth, England. Enemy strength in this area, as determined by Allied intelligence units, was low because the enemy strength in the area was concentrated in the Pas de Calais region. Now let me point this out to you. Pas de Calais area in northwest France is located where that arrow notes. And the Pas de Calais area is located 25 miles across from England. 25 miles across from the cliffs of Dover. This is where this is where Adolf Hitler, the leader of Nazi Germany, and his high command truly believed the Allies were going to attack in the future if indeed they wanted to open up a second front in Europe. It's here where they placed their armor units. It's here where they placed their motorized units. It's here where they placed most of their infantry units. They truly believe here is where the Allies are going to come across the beach and attempt to attack Nazi Germany and its forces in occupied France. What was our estimate of the situation there for? Our intelligence people believe the coastal defenses along all of Northwest France were manned by low priority static divisions. Now, Northwest France that I'm talking about is Normandy, France. Not the part of Calais area, but Normandy, France. They believe the coastal defenses within Normandy, France were manned by low priority static divisions. What I mean by static divisions? These divisions did not have any trucks, did not have any Jeeps, did not have any motorized equipment. And to bring about them being supplied on the waterfront, how were they supplied? Primarily via horses and mules. Now, these static divisions, 
They primarily consisted of units from Axis aligned nations. And our Allied intelligence felt that these units were not going to be reliable. The reliance, therefore, was extremely doubtful. Where were most of these troops from? They were from Poland. They were from the Ukraine. They were from Hungary or Bulgaria. They were consisted of men who did not want to, in essence, oppose Nazi Germany, but they wanted to join Nazi Germany and its forces in, in essence, fighting the Allies. So many of these static divisions were non-German. Enemy air in the area, negligible, because most of the Luftwaffe were supplying its planes to fight the Russians on the Eastern Front. Enemy resistance, therefore, as far as the Allied intelligence units were concerned, probable, but not determined. However, there was a critical failure in their evaluation. That critical failure, they did not, they did not detect the following. Undetected by Allied intelligence was the movement to Normandy region of the veteran 352nd German Infantry Division, tasked to practice anti-invasion maneuvers. This was a very trained and experienced German infantry unit. On June 6th, it did not have to practice anymore. So let's take a look at this now. I do want to zero in on one beach in particular. You're aware there were five major beaches, but the one in which the Allies definitely had to succeed in going across and seizing was Omaha Beach. Let's take a look at this. Omaha Beach is dominated by 100-foot bluffs, and that's on the right. Those bluffs overlook a 500-yard waterline. Now, 500 yards ranges out into the water at low tide. How long is 500 yards? Five football fields. Five football fields. Men landing on D-Day 6th of June on Omaha Beach had to move across these five football fields. And as they did, they encountered water obstacles, a major seawall of about three feet high, consisting of very hard sand and many, many rocks and pebbles. And on the other side of the seawall was a coast road that the Germans put on top, bob wire and mines. And this all before the 100-foot bluffs. One thing that was not detected was a sandbar that was 50 yards further out. You can see how this affects the invasion in just a moment. Now, due to the 100-foot bluffs overlooking the Omaha Beach region, that's the reason why two infantry divisions, two U.S. divisions, the 29th Infantry Division and the 1st Infantry Division were assigned to assault this beach. And the seizure of Omaha Beach was critical. So the invasion forces landing east on gold, Juno, and sword, they were the beaches to be seized by the British and the Canadians. And the beaches west of Omaha Beach, and that being Utah Beach, to be seized by the U.S. 4th Division. By seizing Omaha Beach, you could link up, therefore, those beaches, and the front would be one major united front facing the Germans. Omaha Beach had to be taken. Now, Omaha Beach, let's take a look at what it consisted of. It consisted of the following subsectors. Dog green, dog red, easy red, fox green, and fox red. And seizing the beaches of dog green were the divisions of the 29th Infantry Division. The blue arrow will move in and note the beach exit 
that they would seize in front of what's known as Vierville, and also the beach exit in front of the town of Les Moulins. This is what's known as Les Moulins draw. Easy Red, Fox Green, and Fox Red, they were to be seized by the first U.S. Infantry Division, and they were to take what's known as the St. Laurent draw, the Colville draw, and the Cabour draw. Seize those draws, and in doing so, to enable succeeding troops coming across the beach to move off the beach into the hinterlands. As noted, Omaha Beach, five miles in length, resulted by two infantry divisions. And yes, it encompasses five beach exits protected, by the way, by German strong points, known as Wiedestan Nesters. And by the way, it's here where the Germans concentrate their defensive strength, not across the length of the beach, but at the various Wiedestan Nester locations. All right, more to come. Let's take a look now on what happens on the morning of 6 June, 1944. This is a segment from Saving Private Ryan, and it truly does reflect what the troops of the U.S. military faced the morning of D-Day. Let's take a look at this. What you see is a film reflecting what men of the 29th Infantry Division experienced on D Day. This opposition was never expected. The craft were stopped 50, 30 yards from the beachfront because of an undetected sandbar. And here's what many men did to get out of the craft. They died overboard. Unfortunately, because of the weight of their equipment, they couldn't swim. Their equipment, in essence, was 90 pounds. It caused many men to drown.
okay. What you did see coming across Dog Green Beach was Company A, the 116th Infantry Regiment of the 29th Division. Now, I had an opportunity to, in times past, interview several of the men that did participate in this invasion. And unfortunately, they're no longer with us. But they all did have one thing to say in common, although they didn't realize that they all had said it. But one thing they all did say was when they came across those beaches, the beaches were red and the water was red. So do remember that and we'll never forget it. One thing about this film, it was done by Steven Spielberg. And when he asked the French government if he could film this entire program across the beaches of Normandy and utilize them as the, as the stage for his film, the French government said, no, we will not permit you to film anything of this nature in, in France. Because when it was being considered to be filmed, it was only approximately 30 to 35 years after, after the actual war. So Spielberg was denied the opportunity to film anything regarding Saving Private Ryan within France. Where was Saving Private Ryan filmed? In an area that was very similar to the French coast, in particular, the Normandy coast. It was filmed in Ireland. All right, moving on. Company A does land at 6.30 on time, but they landed because of the coastal coastal current. They landed right of their assigned landing zone. Therefore, they did become disoriented, just like troops on all the other breaches who were also impacted by the incoming coastal tide. And that undetected sandbar that I have reference, it causes the discharge of the assault troops 50 yards further from the beach. And as noted, causing them to plunge into deep water, many of them drowning due to the weight of their field equipment. And the senior leaders of the company, most were immediately killed because they were the first ones to come off the ship and in essence, move on therefore to lead their troops. But as they moved off those landing craft, as they were the first to come off, they were the ones that were immediately shot and killed by the defending forces. And expected artillery and armor support that was to be brought in right in beside the invading forces, it's all lost. Because when this artillery and armor being su supplied within various landing craft were approaching the beaches, with the rough air beach area that they were experiencing, most of those craft were sunk. They, in essence, never made it to the beach. Only two of some 32 floating tanks actually reached the shore. So the support from this type of equipment never did arrive. And the engineers in the second wave that were supposed to come behind the landing troops and clear the beach of all beach obstacles, they were wiped out. And the beach obstacles therefore facing the assault forces therefore remained in place. Communications now become non-existent. Radio sets due to the weight that the men experienced carrying them across the beach, what they did was simply throw the radio sets away. And in essence, it enabled them thereafter to weigh ashore without that weight. Therefore, communications with the beach units landing was non-existent. In essence, take a look at this. Observing the situation on the beach the morning of June 6th, the German beach command, a member of the 352nd Infantry Division, he reports the invasion is stuck. German reinforcements are not requested. Where were the reinforcements? Just 14 miles south of the beachfront, located primarily 
in St. Lowe, France. The situation, therefore, is truly in doubt. So let's take a look at what this actually looked like on the morning of D-Day, 6th of June. What you're looking at is a picture <clears throat> which notes there's a area known as Point de Hoc on the top of the photo. And it's a cliff-like area that juts into, into the English Channel. On top of that cliff area, the Germans had stationed five coastal batteries that had the capability of firing out major cells 10 miles into the sea. That's the reason why the Allies located the troop transports and supply vessels for all the entire invasion 10 miles off the coast because of these coastal batteries assigned to take them out were units of the U.S. Army Ranger Force. Coming across now, D1, which is in essence a sector of Omaha Beach. That was assigned to units of the 116th Infantry Division, 29th Infantry Division. They were to take D1 and D3, taking D E1, E3, and E5 is not noted. Or yes. E1, E2, and E3 is not noted. Or elements of the first U.S. Infantry Division. And they were to take the St. Laurent draw, the Colville draw, and the Cowboy draw. Omaha Beach, June 6, 1944. What does it look like today? Take a look at this beach. This was taken at approximately 6.30 in the morning on a certain day when I was putting together a book about D-Day and a photo was taken uh, for inclusion within the book. No, the beachfront is 500 yards from the water's edge. This is what it looks like today. 500 yards. All right. Zeroing in now on the 29th Infantry Division, the division that in essence brings about the success of the invasion across Omaha Beach. And thereafter, the success of the entire Operation Overlord. With the 116th Infantry Division, their Infantry Regiment, they were assigned the following beach sector objectives. And that is Vierville Draw and Le Moulin Draw. Vierville Draw is in front of Dog Green. Le Moulin Draw is in front of Dog Red. Seize those beach exits and it will enable the troops landing thereafter coming onto that beach to easily move off the beach and into the hinterlands. Beer Rail Draw. Les Moulins draw. Here's what it looks like today. And the picture was taken from a bluff overlooking Omaha Beach. Now keep in mind, Omaha Beach is some five miles long. But what you see directly in front of you is where the unit from the 29th Infantry Division that you saw on screen a few moments ago via this film, Saving Private Ryan. This is where they did land. Dog Green Sector on 6th of June, 1944. Here's what it looked like. Omaha Beach on that date. And above the clouds that were formed via artillery fire, in the center of the photo is a steeple. The steeple is part of the steeple of Vierville, the town of Vierville. Dog Green Sector, here's what it looks like today. Here we draw us on the right. And the photo was taken 500 yards from the beachfront. This is what it actually looked like when the troops came in on, on the day, 6.30 of the morning, 6th of June. Now, as far as Dog Red Sector, this was the other objective to be taken by the 29th Infantry Division. This is what Dog Red Sector looked like 
Beach exit, Le Moulin draw is in the center. And Dograd sector, here's what it looks like today. Exit D3 is in the center of this town known as Le Moulin. It's a beachfront town. And today when you go there, if indeed you do take a tour of this town and you identify yourself as an American coming to tour the area, because you're, you're interested in the D-Day invasion, people there will immediately come up and they'll hug you. They'll shake your hand. They'll kiss you because they have not forgotten till this day the sacrifices of the men coming across these beaches in order to engage the Germans and chase them out of France. D3 exit is located in the center of this photo. Now, overlooking this all are what were known as the Wiedestan nesters. That's those strong points. And here's Wiedestan Nestor 73 overlooking Dog Green Beach and beach exit D1. That's the beach exit leading up to Beerville. And here's a map that notes where that pillbox is located. And here's a view of another one on Omaha Beach, Dog Green Sector. This here now is the view that that those within that Vietnam Nestor 73 had of Omaha Beach, and in essence, the units from the 29th Infantry Division landed. German advantage to all this was the fact that all their Vietnam Nestor weapons, they were pointed down the beach not out to the channel. They're all pointed down the beach. And one major advantage is what comes about for, the, for them because of an allied disadvantage. German gun positions were never detected by offshore naval gunners. And they were never engaged because these Vietnam Nestor locations could not be seen, were not located. To this day, today, if you walk Dog Beach subsectors of Omaha Beach and also the sectors of all the other beaches, you'll find the Vietnam Nestor still in place. They never were truly engaged by Allied gunners. And here's another Wiedersdown Nester, known as Wiedersdown Nester 72. Take a look at the pillbox and take a look at how its front was located, not out to the beach, but down the beach. And they're located near the Wiedersdown Nesters, where troops that were protecting these points. And this is the site next to Wiedersdown Nester 73. Bluffs overlooking Dog Green and Dog White subsectors. Well, now you're standing on that bluff via the photo on the right. So, with all this being the case, let's take a look at this. You're aware of what Beerville Draw looked like and the area surrounding it. You're aware of Lake Moulin Draw and the area surrounding it. Dog White sector was in between. And it's an unassigned assault sector. No unit was assigned with assault dog white because there's no exit off of the beach. So why assign it to anyone? However, here's where the German defense crumbles. This is in essence, as I relate to you over the next couple of minutes, this is, in essence, how the German defense crumbles on all the beaches across, across Omaha Beach in particular. What comes about? There's no de German defenders between the defense posts known as the Wiedestan Nesters. Let me come back here. 
He had Allied victory on Omaha Beach, then therefore, once again, I do want you to take a look at where it is, and the key point being no German defenders between those Peterstown nesters. Key to Allied victory overall, not just on Omaha Beach, but overall, is the following. The German defense units located at the various Wiedestan nesters, their attack from where they least expected. How were they attacked? They were attacked by men who decided that once on that beach and carrying all that they were encountering, as you saw in the film, Save It Private Ryan, instead of turning their back to the enemy and going back to the water and trying to swim away, what they decide to do, get together as groups without leaders, with no communications. And they made the decision amongst themselves, climb that bluff overlooking Dog White and move against the Germans once on top. Because once they got on top of that bluff, what did they find in terms of German opposition? Nothing. Nothing. And this enabled them to move behind the Germans and attack them from their rear end, from their, from their sides. This is what dislocates the Germans along all of Omaha Beach. What comes about are elements of the 1st Infantry Division do the same thing on their beachfront. Instead of turning their backs to the enemy, they decide to band together and climb the bluffs and move against the German resistance. This brings about success on this Beach, Omaha Beach. Red and the troops succeed in dislodging the German defenders from the fortifications. This all comes about about mid afternoon on June 6, six hours after they land. And the town of Beerville, which you saw in those photos, it is captured. And thereafter, the U.S. 116th Infantry Regiment, in essence, takes a break from the from the encounter and recovers to the best that they can from some 325 or 320 dead that they suffered. And one of the units that suffered complete annihilation was Company A that crossed Dog Green. And you saw that on Saving Private Ryan. That company was completely annihilated upon landing and declared ineffective. The U.S. Army Command, commander of, of the forces coming across Omaha and Utah Beach, and that was General Omar Bradley. He's about to halt any further operations across all of Omaha Beach because of what he saw those men suffering. But he changes his mind when he does see he does see the success in dog meat subsectors and the remnants seizing the draws and neighboring troops now to finally move off the beach. And all this is realized six hours after land. Realized, yes, late in the day. And what does Bradley do? as opposed to halting the invasion because of the success on Omaha Beach, he determines to continue the operation. He turns, continues the operation, and thank God as military historians now see it, that he made that decision, because it brings about now further success of Operation Overlord. So now moving on, with the infantry regiment assigned to the 29th Infantry Division that now moved across with the beaches of Omaha, Dog White and Dog Green in particular. What they do once they're seized Beerville and they're positioning themselves on top of the bluffs overlooking the beach, they're immediately ordered. They're immediately ordered to move to the west 
to relieve certain rangers that had climbed up the cliffs of Point the Hawk and went on to assault the coastal batteries on that cliff part. And those U.S. Rangers, in doing so, get trapped, get trapped by forces that do come from St. Louis, France, and in turn encircle them on Point to Hawk. Now, one thing that the truth the Rangers did find when they got on top of the cliff of Point to Hawk is that when they went up to where the coastal batteries were located, what did they find? The guns weren't there. The guns weren't there. What the Germans did was pull the guns about 500 yards to 600 yards further south of the beachfront. And in essence, what did they put in the, the batteries to confuse the Allies about where the cannons were? They put telephone poles within these coastal batteries. And we thought those were the actual cannons. It's these, this site that the Rangers did attack. They did seize the batteries. However, they didn't seize the guns. And ultimately, however, members of the U.S. Ranger unit that did climb the cliffs did locate those guns. And they were not manned by anyone. They were just situated in a road off of the off of the beach front. And what these men did, two individuals in particular, they moved up to where these cannons were located. There were no crews around them because the crews were participating in some type of formation about 500 yards in a field away from where these cannons were located. Now, what did these gentlemen do? Two in particular, one from New Jersey, and that was Bud Lamelk. They took what grenades they had and what devices they had to, in essence, destroy the sighting uh, capability of the of the artillery guns, and also they destroyed the ability to fire those guns. So those two gentlemen, one in particular. Uh, Bud Lamell, they did destroy those guns that were the objective of the Rangers, who, by the way, were now stuck on Point de Hot by the countering force from St. Lo, France. So what comes about? Who's ordered to move against those, those uh, incitement forces? It's the 29th Infantry Division. And they do relieve the Rangers on June 7th. The encircled rangers become free from German opposition. Thereafter, let's take a look at this before we move further on. Here's Point the Hawk. Then, and this is the cliff that overlooks the English Channel. Here's Point the Hawk today. You can go to Point the Hawk and visit the site and see it as it actually existed during the course of World War II. One thing about the site, it's now a U.S. Battlefield Commission park. The French government turned it over to the United States for, for maintenance and, in essence, improvement. And we now, in essence, are in charge of this area that you can visit as a U.S military park. All right. Having done so now, upon relieving the Rangers, figuring that maybe the 29th might be given some opportunity to recover from its losses on the beach and what's losses incurred in the assault on Point to Hot, it no, no time is awarded the division. It is ordered to immediately move west on June 8th and seize the town of what's known as Eastony and link up with the Utah Beach units coming across from the Utah Beach sector. Let's take a look at this on the map. That red arrow notes where Eastney is located, left of the screen. 
And the goal was to link up with units coming from the Utah Beach sector. Critical, critical development in the success of Operation Overlord. And Isini is liberated by the 29th on June 10th. And here's a picture of what Isini looked like then. Here's a picture of what Isini looks like today. One thing about Isini, it is run by the Duke of Isini. He's the individual that's in essence the mayor of this city. One thing about the Duke of Isini, he sent his entire family in advance of what he feared would be a war with Germany in 1940. What he did is he sent his family overseas to the United States for them to be safe from anything that might come forth. And where does he send his family? To Orlando, Florida. And there they're positioned. And in order to sustain a living, what they do is establish a child's playground. And they called it the Disney playground. And in essence, that Disney playground during the course of the war and thereafter became a very, very popular site. In fact, today, it's still in existence. And what is it known as? It's known as Disneyland. Disneyland comes about because of the Duke of Isigny in Normandy, France. Moving on. 29th Infantry Division does link up with Elmas for the 101st Airborne Division coming from Utah Beach. And this is on June 10th. This is a critical development because it leads to a critical achievement by the 29th in terms of making Operation Overlord a success. The Normandy Landing Beach areas to the west now are linked up. Are linked up. And here's a picture of the Orville Sullivan Bridge today. And looking east toward Easton. Thereafter, what is determined by Omar Bradley and his staff is the next thing that the Allies need to do is to, after linking up with the units from coming across from Utah Beach, thereafter. Capture the critical railroad and canal junction town of St. Lo in Normandy, France. It's 18 miles south of, of Isigny. And look who gets the mission to do so. The infantry division, as far as Brian Bradley is concerned, that was successful in bringing about the defeat of the Germans on the beachfront of Omaha Beach and successful moving against the Germans in moving west and linking up with the units coming across from Utah Beach. It is the 29th Infantry Division. It's assigned the mission to seize St. Lo in Normandy, France. And here's a picture of where St. Lo is located. So what comes about? St. Lo, Normandy, France, it is captured by the 29th Infantry Division. Take a look at the date. Picture of St. Lo as the American units entered into it. 40 long and agonizing days after D-Day. 40 long and agonizing days after D-Day. Why did it take so long for the 29th Infantry Division to do so, let's take a look at this. It's because of the nature of the terrain in Normandy, France. It's what's known as the Hedgerow Country. And one thing about the Hedgerow Country, let's take a look at it. This is how it was viewed by Allied intelligence from aircraft overflying the area. And what they saw are all these fields that are divided by, by hedges to be fields divided by hedges approximately two to three feet high. That was their judgment, two to three feet high. But in reality, what they did not know was that these hedgerows were 25 to 30 feet high. 
And that's what they actually look like during the course of the invasion thereafter. 25 to 30 feet high. The nature of the terrain was never truly understood by the planners of Operation Overlord. This is what inhibited the 29th from easily moving from Eastney down toward St. Lo. The terrain, not the opposition, the terrain. Hedgerow country then, Hedgerow country now. This picture was taken for my book. And in essence, the book was published in 2014. And here's what the Hedgerow country looked like then. The Germans utilized these hedgerows as defensive works to halt any Allied advance. So what does come about? 20th Infantry Division does seize and does secure St. Lo on July 18, 1944. Picture of St. Lo today as you walk through the center of town. And here's that church that has seemed totally obliterated when the 29th elements moved into St. Lowe in 1944. This is what it looks like today. In essence, mission accomplished by the 29th Infantry Division. Now, with all this having come forth, what happened to the British Canadian forces after they crossed the the Normandy beach areas? Well, let's take a look at what happened to them. They do successfully move across their beaches, Shore, Gold, Juno, and they move down towards Cizy, a key French town, or French town, yes, known as Con France. However, what does come about is as they move across the beaches, Several days after the actual invasion, it's then that Adolf Hitler and his high command make the decision that, in essence, maybe the real invasion of the Allies is coming across the Normandy beaches, and they're not going to be coming across the English Channel to into Pas de Calais. So it's then that they decide, days later on, after the actual invasion, in Normandy. Days later on, they start to send armored units and motorized units south to encounter the British and Canadian as they are coming across their beach fronts. And they successfully do so. The British and Canadian forces are halted around the con of France. And now you know why. Now, what does enable the Allies to advance thereafter? Well, let's take a look at this. It's the capture of St. Lo by the 29th Infantry Division. What comes about is the following. It enables the Allied command to put together thereafter and major, major armor and armor force assault known as Operation Cobra. Troops are positioned on the Cotonan Peninsula. That's the peninsula that's on the left of the screen. And to a certain extent, they're supplied by the port of Sherborne, which was taken by the 101st Airborne Division. With these forces, they're placed under the command of U.S. General George S. Pat. And what occurs is he moves south of St. Lo on July 25th, 1944, moves down along the Cote Dame Peninsula. Once he gets south of the peninsula, he then moves certain number of forces to the west and indeed capture more ports that can be utilized to supply the Allies in France. But more importantly, he moves east. He moves against the Germans that are attacking the French and the British at Caen. And as he moves east, he's moving in behind them, behind them. 
and he assaults the Germans from which, quite frankly, they did not expect. So what comes about during the critical month of July and August 1944 with Operation Cobra? The outcome is the defeat of the Nazi forces in France. And what comes about thereafter? Due to the success across all the beaches of, of Operation Overlord, but in particular, Omaha Beach. What comes about 11 months later on? The ultimate collapse of Nazi Germany comes about on May 11, 1945. On May 11, 1945, Nazi Germany surrenders unconditionally. And here's a picture of the individual that heads up the combined staff of the German Armed Forces, General Alfred Jodl, who's signing an unconditional surrender document in Supreme Headquarters of Allied Expeditionary Forces, and that's it. General Eisenhower's headquarters, located in Reims, France. This is all a result of all of the result of the success of Operation Overlord. And hopefully now, as we begin to close out, you've come to understand why that operation did become a success. So the longest walk for the 29th Infantry Division took them two days to move against the Point de Hoc resistance, yet they had landed, yet they had landed on Omaha Beach. Took them two days later on to gain the seizure of Isimi and link up with the forces coming across Utah Beach. Thereafter, it took them 38 long days to seize the town of St. Lo. And hopefully now you have an understanding as to why. But look at, look at the division that was assigned all these, all these missions. That, that division, the 29th Infantry Division, a National Guard unit from New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. 29th Infantry Division, it does suffer the course of all this fighting. Losses mount up to nearly 40% of its fighting strength. And because of that, this division is in particular recognized by the French government to this very day, to this very day. And it was recognized just recently during the course of the ceremonies that were conducted for the 80th anniversary of this operation in Normandy, France. But one thing that the French have erected and have put in place as a permanent as a permanent memorial to the U.S. National Guard, and it happens to be the National Guard Monument at Grand Comte Maisie, which is a town that overlooks overlooks the the cliffside of Normandy, France. We'd like to now end the program with this as a way of commemorating what our troops experienced and what they did on D-Day 6 of June and thereafter. Oops, I have to go back. When the call went out for volunteers and a nation being born, no sunshine patriot speeches, no summer soldiers' songs, or the special men who paid the price to keep the country strong. We were released. We were released. We were released. We were 
forge to trail all of achieving the glory and the sacrifice we do our job each day. We're citizens and soldiers, army all the way. This does signal out the U.S. Army. However, it's also a tribute to all those that served during the course of the war in the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Marines, the U.S. Army Air Force, also the Merchant Marines, also all those that served on the home front, supplying our forces overseas with what was necessary for them to engage the enemy and succeed in overcoming them and defeating them. In essence, it's a tribute to all. It's, in essence, paying respect and honor and gratitude to all veterans. And ladies and gentlemen, that's that's it. Hopefully now you have come to understand to a certain extent, hoping to put anyone to sleep, what happened, happened how it happened, but most importantly, why did it happen? And I do have two books that I did write, uh, one reflecting, in essence, what I just relayed during the course of this presentation. That's a book known as The Longest Walk. And it can be purchased by contacting me or sending me a, a check at my office in Neptune, New Jersey. And the other is a book recently uh, published that reflects what actually occurred on the days of surrender in Reims, France in 1945. So these books are for sale. Uh, one book is $20 per copy. The other book is $10 per copy. 